This Elden Ring series covers how to do all quests and missable content in order so that all choices and rewards will be available. For best results, follow this series from the start of Part 1. There will be spoilers in the form of important information, and as usual, useful timestamps can be found in the video description. At the end of Part 6, we had just completed all important quests in the mountaintops before heading to the Halic Tree. In Part 7, we will be venturing through the Halic Tree. Before that though, I wanted to take a few minutes to cover all the ancient dragon smithing stones and legendary ashen remains that were missed up to this point, along with a couple of other important items. Feel free to skip ahead to the Halic Tree timestamps if none of this interests you. To start, there was one final step so to speak in Roderica's quest. After Roderica gains the ability to tune spirits, you can return to the location where the Chrysalid's Memento was located to get a new item, the Crimson Hood. It is identical to the hood previously worn by Roderica, and it boosts vigor by one point. Moving on, there is a somber ancient dragon smithing stone to the southeast of the Dynasty Mausoleum Midpoint Site of Grace. It's in a chest that is under guard by several enemies. I found that the Assassin's Gambit skill made it relatively easy to sneak in, grab the smithing stone, and slink back out. There is an ancient dragon smithing stone a short distance east from the Forlorn Cave Dungeon. A magma worm is guarding the stone, however, you can just run past it, grab the smithing stone, then run away. To the west of the inner consecrated snowfield site of grace, you'll find an enemy caravan transporting a flowing curved sword. However, if you pass time until nightfall, the caravan will then be accompanied by two knights cavalry, one on each side of the caravan. You can carefully pull and deal with the black knights one at a time. If only one is defeated before you rest or die, then it will respawn. Both knights must be defeated within a single life in order for it to count. Once that has been accomplished, you'll get the Knight's Cavalry Armor Set along with an additional Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone. The entrance to the Yellow Annex Tunnel is located near the southwest cliffs of the Snowfields. While I won't be fully exploring this dungeon, I will show a walkthrough to the one Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone that you can get here. It is relatively easy to reach and doesn't require fighting any difficult enemies. That's everything from the Consecrated Snowfields. Now we'll take a brief trip back to Kaled. We'll actually start underground in Siofra River. At the far northeast edge of Siofra, there is a lift that will take you to a secluded area in Kaled. To the northwest, you'll find a Colosseum and a massive warrior jar. Speak with the giant jar to trigger a special event where three red summoning signs will appear on the ground. All three adversaries must be summoned and defeated in a single life for it to count. I recommend starting with whichever one you find to be the most difficult. For me, that was the Paladin-style opponent, the Eastmost Summoning Sign. After defeating all three adversaries, speak with the Warrior Jar once again to get the Jar's Arsenal Talisman, which is the best Arsenal-style talisman in the game. This next item is located a short distance from the Fort Gale North Site of Grace and will be extremely useful later on. It is the Flame of the Red Mane's Ash of War, and it is obtained by defeating an invisible treasure scarab. Another extremely useful Ash of War is the Bloodhound Step. Make sure it's nighttime, then travel southeast from the Bestial Sanctum to reach the bridge leading to Lanay's Rise. A Knight's Cavalry should be patrolling the bridge and will drop this Great Ash of War when defeated. The final bell-bearing hunter location is at the isolated merchant's shack in the Dragon Barrow. You'll need to pass time until night, then rest at the site of grace before the hunter will spawn. 
This is the most difficult version of the Hunter, and it's challenging enough that I put off facing it until now. When defeated, it will drop the Gravity Stone Peddler's Bell Bearing. Now we are going to get three legendary Ashen Remains, all near areas we've already been to. The first will be located at the War Dead Catacombs. To reach it, you'll need to travel a far distance north from the Star Scourge Radon site of Grace. Right near the coastline, there is a modest pair of doors that lead down into this dungeon. The only annoying part about this dungeon are the Spectral Knight Archers that will spear you with gravity arrows as you make your way to the lever that opens the dungeon's boss door. However, Assassin's Gambit will drastically reduce the range that they will spot you at, making it much easier to get past them. As a quick aside, beneath the initial platform in this dungeon, you'll find a chest containing the Collapsing Star's Sorcery. You'll need to slip by a couple archers and several other enemies, eventually jumping through a window or two to reach the elevated platform where the lever is located. Pull it, then make your way back to the site of Grace to rest. Then head straight across the initial chamber to reach the boss room. A putrid tree spirit will need to be defeated, but at this point it shouldn't pose too much of a challenge. The tree spirit's defeat will be rewarded with the legendary Redmane Knight Oga spirit summons. Our next stop is the Tomb Sword Catacombs. The entrance is a short distance south from the Church of the Pilgrimage. The most difficult part of this dungeon is finding it. Its entrance is tucked in a hillside behind some ruins. Once you've made it inside, it's a relatively simple route to reach the lever, the main trick being a flamethrower trap that can be ridden to an upper level. Pull the lever, then head to the boss room which is near the entrance of the dungeon. You'll just need to defeat a single shade enemy which went down in two swings for me. Lutel the Headless, a legendary spirit summons is the reward. We have one more stop before going to the Hallow Tree. It's the Sainted Hero's Grave in Altus Plateau. This dungeon is a little bit tricky as any enemies coated in darkness will be immune to attacks until the coating is removed by bringing them into the light. Specifically, it's the golden circles of light found at set points throughout the dungeon. There is really only one darkness-coated enemy that must be defeated for this dungeon, so we will mostly just avoid the others as we make our way through. There is a collapsing floor that you can walk around to grab the Landale Soldier Spirit Ashes, then step on the trap floor to continue progressing. Past the guillotine traps, you'll find a ladder that leads to an upper level. Ahead, there is a Grave Warden Duelist coated in darkness. You may want to deal with the Revenant that appears behind before getting the attention of the Duelist.
you'll need to kite the duelist all the way to the room with a lever just before encountering the guillotine traps. The circle of light there will remove the coat of darkness from the duelist, allowing it to be defeated. Defeating the duelist will open the boss door for this dungeon, which is located at the end of the hallway containing the guillotine traps. Inside, you'll need to face off with the ancient hero of Zammer, which will be fairly trivial at this point. When defeated, it will drop the final legendary Ashen Remains that we missed, Ancient Dragon Knight Kristoff. The final legendary Ashen Remains in the game is located at the Halleck Tree, which is where we are headed next. Fast travel to the Halleck Tree Canopy Site of Grace, which we got to near the end of Part 6 in this series, then begin making your way down to the Halleck Tree proper. The Assassin's Gambit proves its worth once again, as it will allow you to make the final stretch down to the Halleck Tree while remaining undetected by the large Oracle Envoy serving as a sentry. Next, we will make our way to the town plaza, grabbing an ancient dragon smithing stone along the way. The ancient dragon smithing stone is guarded by a misbegotten warrior. With Assassin's Gambit, it will only notice you after you've already grabbed the legendary smithing stone and started towards the next Site of Grace. Our next objective is to activate a shortcut back to the Halleck Tree Town Site of Grace. Use Assassin's Gambit to make avoiding the Spirit Caller Snail easier. You can jump to and run over the next rooftop, or failing that, run through beneath. Once you get to the following bridge, leap to your left and take the birdcage lift to unlock a very nice shortcut back to the Hallow Tree Town site of Grace. Returning to the bottom of the lift, make your way over to the fog wall. Beyond it, you'll face off with Loretta, Knight of the Hallow Tree. This boss isn't too difficult, at least not compared to what lies ahead, and she will drop Loretta's War Sickle and the Loretta's Mastery spell when defeated. Find and activate the new Site of Grace, the point where you can interact with the Grace might be slightly offset from where it appears to be. Afterwards, continue forward and slide down what has to be the tallest ladder in the game. On your way down, you may notice a chest sitting on the rooftop below. Head up the spiral staircase to see what's inside, which turns out to be another ancient dragon smithing stone. After grabbing it, make your way back down the staircase, then take a lift further down. Make sure to defeat the clean rot knight before continuing forward. Millicent is just ahead in the prayer room, and the knight could put her in danger if it isn't dealt with first. If Millicent isn't in the prayer room, check back at the last location you spoke with her, which should be near the ancient Snow Valley ruins speak through all of her dialogue, and then return to the Halleck Tree. The prayer room will serve as a temporary base of operations. First off, speak with Millicent and go through all of her dialogue. If you want, you can then return to Gowrie at his shack and speak with him for some new dialogue. 
Next up, we will be getting a legendary smithing stone and a legendary talisman. Head north out of the prayer room. It's a little tricky, but you'll want to jump to the first archway and walk along it to reach the outer ringed walkway. This will allow you to evade detection by a patrolling Ur-Tree avatar. You can fight the Ur-Tree if you want, and it drops the Rotten Staff weapon when defeated. Grab the somber ancient dragon smithing stone near the end of the walkway, then safely drop down to the pit below. This should bypass the revenants that prowl this area, and give you direct access to a room that requires a stone sword key to open. Inside, you'll find the Marika Source Seal, a legendary talisman. Return to the prayer room and head out the same exit, then start descending down the multiple staircases. Leap over the railing to the right just before entering a chamber to land on a platform below. Enter through a somewhat hidden doorway to reach a seedbed curse. We will start from the prayer room one more time. Head along the upper levels, then platform your way to a garden area populated with scarabs. There will be a room to the southwest where the Clean Rot Knight Finlay Ashes are located. They are in a chest under guard by a Clean Rot Knight. This should be the last of the legendary Ashen remains and will unlock the associated achievement or trophy when obtained. Afterwards, continue moving northwest. Leap to an arch and ascend to an elevated area. Grab the somber ancient dragon smithing stone on your left before proceeding forward to find the final seedbed curse. We will complete Dung Eater's quest in a moment, for now, continue moving forward. Drop down to an arch and scale it to reach the outer ringed walkway. Run up the staircase to the west and grab the Halleck Tree Soldier Ashes before scaling another arch, then sprint jump to the nearby platform. This will bypass the extremely annoying group of enemy soldiers and turrets below and get you a Halleck Tree Knight Helm in the process. Discover the Elphiel in our wall site of grace, then take your seedbed curses and fast travel to the underground roadside in Landell sewers. Return to Dung Eater's sewer jail to find him strapped in a chair. If he isn't there, you may need to speak with him back at Roundtable Hold first. After giving him a total of 5 seabed curses, which you should have gotten at this point, the game will fade to black and Dung Eater will share some parting words. After that, you'll be able to pick up the Mending Rune of the Fell Curse from Dung Eater's body, which will give the option to pick the Blessing of Despair ending for the game. Reload the game and you'll find the Omen's armor set near Dung Eater's body, free for the taking. And that is the end of Dung Eater's quest. Next up, we will be completing Millicent's quest. To that end, return to the Elphiel inner wall, then make your way over to the drainage channel. I highly recommend using the Bloodhound step skill as it will make crossing the Scarlet Rot much easier.
From this site of grace, you can head back out the west exit and climb the ladder. Make your way across branches to reach a small island with a pit full of scarlet rot. A legendary Great Grave Glovewort sits in the pit, and trying to reach it will cause a Scarlet Rot variant of the Ulcerated Tree Spirit to emerge, which will need to be defeated. This thing is a huge pain, especially for melee builds. Fortunately, the Flame of the Red Mane's Ash of War makes it significantly easier. I equipped it to my plus 22 Claymore and was able to stun the boss every three times I hit it with fire. This opened up ample opportunities for critical strikes. It didn't turn the fight into a cakewalk, but it did turn it into a manageable challenge. Defeating the Tree Spirit will progress Millicent's quest, causing two summoning signs to appear nearby. You'll want to hold off on using either summoning sign for a moment. The first reason is that there is actually some unique dialogue you can get out of Gowrie, and it's only available after defeating the Ulcerated Tree Spirit. Let's just say it's worth a trip to Gowrie Shack to hear it, as it will give important context to the final steps in Millicent's quest. Speaking of which, we are about to make an extremely important choice, both regarding the fate of Millicent and a couple other major events in the game. While there will be informational spoilers in this next section, I think you will want to know this information before making your choice, especially if you've already inherited the Frenzied Flame. First, let's discuss the choice with regards to Millicent's quest and how it ends. If you assist Millicent by picking the gold summoning sign, which is what Millicent wants, the upside is that you'll get the Rotten Winged Sword Insignia Talisman immediately after success. You'll also get the Unalloyed Gold Needle back from Millicent. This can be used later on, after defeating Melania, to get Mikola's Needle and a somber Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone. The downside is that Millicent will die, never reaching her true potential. In addition, Gowrie will be alive, but very distraught. He will die permanently if hit, dropping his bell bearing in the Phlox Canvas Talisman. However, you might want to hold off on hitting him until just before starting New Game Plus. The reason why is because where there is a living NPC, there is the potential for future content. On the other hand, if you challenge Millicent by picking the Red Summoning Sign, which is what Gowry wants, the upside is that you'll get the Millicent's Prosthesis Talisman immediately after success. In addition, Millicent will blossom into a flower, with the potential of transforming into a Scarlet Valkyrie later on, perhaps in future updates of the game. Although, it remains to be seen whether this is actually a good thing for Millicent. Also, Gowrie will die, and you can go get the Phlox Canvas Talisman from his body. The downside is that you will not get the Unalloyed Gold Needle back from Millicent, which means you will not be able to get Mikola's Needle, nor the somber Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone after defeating Melania. Now, those are the more immediate consequences, however, the choice you make here also impacts key outcomes in Elden Ring's main questline. I've narrowed down this explanation to two main outcomes. The first outcome is whether Melina is spared, and the second outcome is which game ending you get. Let's start with a quick recap. If you want Melina to be spared, you will need to inherit the Frenzied Flame before burning the Earth Tree at the Forge of the Giants. You should know that Melina does not want to be spared. Instead, she will be upset with you and leave your company for inheriting the Frenzied Flame. This is because inheriting the Frenzied Flame makes it very likely that you will become the Lord of Frenzied Flame and destroy the Lands Between, which is Melina's worst fear. That brings us to the next point of discussion. Inheriting the Frenzied Flame will lock you into the Lord of Frenzied Flame ending of the game, which will prevent you from picking one of the game's other endings. That is, unless you subdue the Frenzied Flame. Subduing the Frenzied Flame will lock you out of the Lord of Frenzied Flame ending, but will allow you to pick a different ending instead. And this is where Millicent's quest comes in. Mikola's Needle is required to subdue the inherited Frenzied Flame. Again, you only get Mikola's Needle by assisting Millicent, and this is what I'm planning to do. If you challenge Millicent, you will not get Mikola's Needle. There is also a final option that I haven't brought up yet. 
you can hold off on inheriting the Frenzied Flame until after beating the game and picking an ending. The downsides to this path are that Melina will not be spared and you will need to wait to complete Hyetta's quest until after beating the game. Okay, hopefully I explained that well enough for you to make an informed decision regarding Millicent's fate. If I didn't, you can reach out in the comment section and I will do my best to help. Returning to the walkthrough, go with the gold summoning sign if you've decided to assist Millicent and the red summoning sign if you've decided to challenge her. In either case, you'll get a talisman after completing the encounter. If you chose to assist Millicent, you can find her nearby afterwards. Speak through all of her dialogue, then reload the game to get the unalloyed gold needle from her body, which we will need later. After doing that, return to Gowry at his shack. If you challenged Millicent, Gowry will be dead and you can pick up his bell bearing and the Phlox canvas talisman. If you assisted Millicent, then Gowry will be alive and in a state of despair. In this state, Gowry will die and stay dead after taking a single hit, dropping both his bell bearing and the talisman. Personally, I'm going to hold off on hitting him to follow my cardinal rule, which is to not attack NPCs unless they are obviously meant to be attacked. If you challenged Millicent, then at this point you are done with her quest. If you assisted Millicent, then there is still one more step, but before we can do it, we will need to get to and defeat Melania. To that end, return to the drainage channel at the Hallow Tree and head out the east exit. You'll need to move across roots and arches to reach the upper rooftop of the cathedral to the north. You'll need to drop down on a group of pest enemies, a task made far easier with the Assassin's Gambit Ash of War. The cluster is guarding a chest, which contains the legendary Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman. Run out the main entrance and down the hill to the west. Once again, Assassin's Gambit will come in very handy here, helping you keep a low profile as you grab the Ghost Glove Warp Picker's Bell Bearing 3 before doubling back to the Cathedral. Find the lift and take it down to the Hallow Tree Roots, where Melania is fought. There is a room to the southeast with another Scarlet Blossom, where you can find the Traveler's Armor Set, which is basically Millicent's outfit. Melania was very tough, so much that I had to switch up my strategy to defeat her. I equipped talismans that boosted my physical defense, underwent rebirth to have enough FP to summon Black Knife Tish, and give myself lots of HP, then went and upgraded Black Knife Tish to plus 10. I found that the God Slayer's Greatsword did a great job at staggering and stunning Melania, so I ended up using that. It was also upgraded to plus 10. My main strategy was to stun Melania with heavy and jump attacks, hit her with a critical hit, then immediately use the Greatsword's unique skill to deal even more damage. There were also a lot of carefully and not so carefully timed dodges. It was still very tough, and I just barely managed to eke out a victory by the skin of my teeth, and that was after a really good first phase. With that being said, I wish you all the best of luck, and I'm sure that any chi strategies shared in the comments section will be greatly appreciated. However you manage it, after defeating Melania, reload the game and a Scarlet Flower will appear in the boss room. Return the unalloyed gold needle to it to receive the somber ancient dragon smithing stone along with Mikola's needle. It won't be until part 8 that we get the chance to use Mikola's needle, but for now, you can check off Millicent's quest as complete. With the Hallow Tree all but cleared, we can return to the mountaintops to face off with the Fire Giant. Before doing that, there is an ancient dragon smithing stone that you can grab from inside the jaw of a giant skull, near the Church of Repose. Afterwards, head a short distance east and discover the foot of the forge. Cross over the nearby chain to face off with the fire giant. 
Right after entering, you should see a gold summoning sign for Alexander, at least if his quest hasn't bugged out for you. I don't think you need to summon him to progress his quest, but I always do out of paranoia if nothing else. I would give tips on how to defeat the fire giant, but honestly, if you were able to defeat that scarlet rot tree spirit and Melania, then the fire giant will be child's play by comparison. As a forewarning, we have an important decision coming up, so you'll want to watch ahead before progressing further. After defeating the fire giant, discover the new site of grace nearby, then ascend the enormous chain link to the northeast to reach the Forge of the Giants. Loop clockwise around the rim of the forge to reach the site of grace where you can burn the Ur tree to advance the main questline of the game. If you want to spare Melina, then make sure to inherit the Frenzied Flame at the prescription beneath Blaindell first. But remember, this will lock you into the Lord of Frenzied Flame ending of the game unless you have Mikola's Needle. If you are inheriting the Frenzied Flame at this point, you can also speak with Hyetta after to complete her quest and obtain the Frenzied Flame Seal. In addition, Shabriri will vanish from near the Zammer Ruins, leaving behind the Ronin's armor set. As long as all prior arrangements are taken care of, rest at the Forge of the Giant's Site of Grace and find the appropriate prompt. If you haven't inherited the Frenzied Flame, the prompt will be to talk to Melina. If you have inherited the Frenzied Flame, the prompt will be listen to the sounds of flame. Whichever you go with, both will have the same end result, which is transportation to the crumbling fair Missoula. You'll be unable to fast travel until you discover and rest at the first Site of Grace, and I'll be showing a walkthrough to this site of grace as I wrap things up. That's it for part 7. Feel free to explore the lands between on your own, just try to avoid progressing too far into the crumbling fair of Missoula. Specifically, you'll want to hold off on defeating and advancing past the Godskin Duo boss. More important than that, make sure you do not defeat Malaketh, which is the final boss in the crumbling fair of Missoula. If you need help with anything covered in this video, you can reach out in the comments section where I will do my best to help. I'll also have a pinned comment that I update with helpful information as time goes on. In part 8, we will venture through the crumbling fair Missoula, completing a bunch of important quests and tasks along the way. Afterwards, we will finish up the quest for Goldmask, Corrin, and an NPC we have yet to meet, Jarbarn. You can find part 8 over on my channel, and if you're new, consider subscribing. You're helping me feed my cat, her name's Marshmallow. There are other ways you can support the channel too. The Marshmallow merch store features professional Elden Ring inspired designs of your favorite fluffball. We also have a channel membership now. By pledging $3 a month, you'll get a custom badge that upgrades over time to let others know you're an MVP, along with priority for responses from me to your comments and questions. That's my spiel. Have a great day. If you're here today, have a great Friday and a great weekend. And as always, thanks for watching.